asymmetric urgs. I'm talking about games like Diablo, Victor Fran, fucking SpongeBob Employee of the Month. Isometric RPGs or role-playing games, if you're a fucking mathematician or whatever, have been around for a super long time and in a lot of ways have set the bar for role-playing games as a whole, whether that be through their control, story, or just the pretty ass face it's got. <laughs> Aw, isn't that just fucking terrifying? So today I wanted to walk through a bunch of random isometric RPG games that I've known and loved and share them with you because fuck you, I want to. I suppose I should use this moment to explain exactly what the fuck isometric means. Uh, isometric refers to the angle at which a camera is placed in a game. It combines the elements of both the side view and a top-down camera to generate a three-dimensional effect where the player can see the height, width, and depth of items in the game world while still maintaining a fixed camera. Generally speaking, this allows developers to create vivid environments and set pieces that are simultaneously easier and more encapsulating than those in 2D top-down or side-scrolling games. Fun fact actually, Diablo may be one of the most well-known isometric games, but it is by no means the first, as I initially thought it was. In researching this design style, I encountered a game called Zaxxon, which was released by Sega back in 1982 and looked like this. Interestingly enough, this game was also the first example of objects casting shadows, which is pretty cool considering how old the tech is. I set out thinking that I was going to be talking about Diablo all day, so I was pleasantly surprised to be so wrong. Speaking of which... Diablo might just be the king of RPG games, given how long it survived as a prominent title in the gaming community. Launching in 1997 for PC and 1998 for PlayStation and Mac OS, the first Diablo game was met with massive approval, selling over a million copies worldwide within the first year. Of that, roughly 670,000 came from the US. It was that success that led not only to the development and release of the Hellfire DLC, but also Diablo 2 in 2000 and Diablo 3 in 2012. Additionally, Diablo 4 was announced at BlizzCon back in 2019 and has since been shown to be a sort of reboot for the series, much like the most recent God of War title. For the most part, I only have experience with Diablo 3 and its expansions, however I can say without a doubt that this community surrounding the game has been die-hard. Case in point, there was originally a plan to remaster Diablo 2, and fans lost their minds getting hyped for it. Honestly, I can't blame them either. Even as someone who has limited experience of the first few titles, I love these games on lore alone. The world of Sanctuary feels really alive and expansive, populated with secrets and monsters and heroes like. There's always something extra you can learn about the story you're playing, regardless of which one you pick, so long as you make the effort to explore all the nooks and books and crannies and monster fannies that you encounter. Even from a visual standpoint, these games have always looked amazing, with understandable and appealing UIs, textures, and models. It just works. There's obviously passion for these titles, and they just kept getting better despite the title changing hands over the years. Yeah, I didn't know that Blizzard Entertainment wasn't always responsible for the development of the Diablo series either. Ports for the games have been handled by EA, Ubisoft, and Synergistic Software, and development of PC releases was in the hands of Blizzard North Studios until they closed back in 2005. So, seeing as how the series has survived countless shifts and changes, including three to four generations of consoles, it's fair to say that Diablo 4 is going to be pretty goddamn awesome. Let's say you don't feel like waiting, though. Maybe you're a cheap motherfucker fucker with no patience. In that case, I've got a great secondary option for you. Are you a cheap bastard who likes voxel-based graphics and has a pension for MMOs? Then Rowan the Mad God has been around forever and you should probably already know about it. If you already know about this game, then you definitely know that this is me cheating and throwing a curveball at the definition of what the fuck we're talking about here. Too long, didn't read, couldn't be bothered to give two shits. My point here today is, uh, go fuck yourself. Realm of the Mad God is a free-to-play MMORPG created by Wild Shadow Studios and was released to the public back in 2012. Since then, even eight years later, the game has been continually updated and fleshed out to a state where it defies your expectations as to what you're getting yourself into. The last time I had played this game was back in high school, like four or five eons ago, and I was shocked to see how much it's changed. What exactly can you expect when you boot this bitch up? Well, aside from the loud ass title music, you've got a quest system, massive servers, a dungeon system, cosmetic skins for classes, a class system, microtransactions, a guild system, fucking everything else. This game is actually pretty massive, but like in a minuscule kind of way. Like everything that you could possibly want is here, but it's all super simple and compact. It's not like World of Warcraft where there's like 250,000 menus of complex hotkeys and submenus to make you feel like you've just broken the matrix. What the fuck am I even looking at right now? It's a bite-sized portion of that complexity covered in sugar and spice that's technically free. It's pretty good shit. Fun fact, the art for this game actually originated from a Creative Commons art set called Lo-Fi Roguelike, created by an artist named Oryx. Wild Shadow negotiated a license with the artist to keep using the sprites that they were already applying to the beta versions of 
the game once it was adapted into a commercial product and continue to use it as the game gets updated. But Dwayne, how is this game tweeting? Well, that's a good question, disturbingly uwu-esque voice. Uh, technically this is a closer to a top-down bullet hell game than it is an isometric fixed angle like Diablo just based on how everything is laid out. On top of that, and this is actually kind of cool, you can rotate the camera around the player to simulate turning in 3D space while maintaining a consistent shape and style for the sprites. This is actually really rare for games with a camera like this, but it's still not the only one thanks to... Imagine this scenario. Van Helsing has an orgy with the characters from Diablo and films it with a camera he borrows from the Archer class in Realm of the Mad God. That would be Victor Vran. The best of the best served with a side of sarcasm. Victor Vran was created by the lovely people over at Heyman Mott Games, the people who were behind Surviving Mars and Tropical 4. They eventually went on to release a pair of DLCs to expand upon the content of the game as well, but they are particularly important, so fuck them. VV does a lot right, mostly because it strives to be very mechanically different from other titles with particular regard to combat, and movement, and abilities. Unlike games like Diablo, where you're target is chosen by actually clicking on whatever the monster you're planning on beheading, Vranny the Nanny utilizes a directional combat system where different weapons have different amounts of reach, and you just have to stand close enough to the enemy to hit them. Whatever weapon you have selected also changes the abilities that you have access to. You can snipe spiders with shotguns, sure that's how fucking shotguns work, yeah definitely, grand slam ghosts with hammers, and turn pretty much anything into shredded cheese using a scythe. A combat system like this works so well, mostly because it isn't tied to movement like Diablo's. Similar to Realm of the Mad Guide, your movement is guided using the WASD keys in the mouse, and a few miscellaneous buttons control the special attacks. This is a significantly more accessible and precise system than clickers like Diablo, and I frankly love it. On top of independent movement control, Ran the Man also includes a few special details that most games lack. Jumps to the walls and rolls of the dodge. You can either double tap a movement key or use the shift key and the movement key to dodge in any given direction. This means that combat is more about timing than calculating which I find to be generally more satisfying. Dying is no longer the result of missing your cooldown timer, it's your own fault for not dodging a telegraph move in time. The wall jumps are actually especially cool on top of that if you're like me and you like to waste time looking around for shiny shit. Being able to jump independently of a game's context actions means that level designs become way more complex as well, and finding the secrets hidden throughout each dungeon is an actual adventure. It factors into combat a slight amount, but it's generally not a burden so it's not a big deal in that context. The more important facet of combat is his demon powers. You see, Gran is a demon hunter, but he's made a very significant sacrifice that we don't know about at the start of the game in his personal life to wield demonic powers in the name of protecting the world from monsters. This means that throughout the game you'll encounter dozens of different monster abilities that do shit like throw purple lawnmower blades at skeletons or cause the fucking apocalypse, but just a little bit. They're awesome, like genuinely. As far as RPGs go, each element of the gameplay that has been fashioned here for us is unique in its own way and comes together to make a seriously enjoyable experience. Now the biggest setback in all of this is that there's a less expansive amount of customization than in other games, namely Diablo or Path of Exile, assuming anybody still plays that one anymore. Since your active combat abilities outside of demon powers are tied to your current weapon, there are no adaptations to be made to those mechanics. Additionally, there isn't a complex armor system like Diablo, where you can build your own sets specific to your needs or character build. Instead, armor is handled by equipping an entire outfit all at once, with that outfit being designed to give the player specific effects that guide the build that you're constructing but don't necessarily allow for customization to specify on it. It's by no means bare bones, so there's still a lot to play with, but it's certainly nothing crazy like World of Warcraft, how the fuck do you see through all these menus? Altogether, Vivacious Vanity is a surprisingly unique romp that accomplished exactly what they were thinking of. And you guys can always go well though, because- Hey, remember Deep Silver? Uh, me neither, but apparently they released a game called Dead Island back in 2011. I mean, it sounds kind of anticlimactic to me, but whatever. To be completely fair, Dead Island wasn't all bad. Portions of the game did have redeeming qualities, the introduction in particular, and the trailer got us all hooked in like nothing before. It just so happens that it's also true that Deep Silver has no idea how to write a game like that to maintain its intrigue and the desire to keep playing tapers off fast after that first act. Well, despite releasing a second game of the same FPS survival horror action genre to less than positive reviews, Deep Silver continued to commission games in the Dead Island series, specifically using a third party developer to produce a MOBA, and they called that MOBA Dead Island Epidemic. Now, a MOBA and an RPG are not the same thing at all, so I understand if you're thinking this weird thought right about now. 
but just let me explain. Fucking dick ass. While the primary mode of the game was a three team battle for survival against one another, there was also a PvE mode that included minor story segments involving new and old characters from the series that tied everything together. While I could separate this into two separate videos about MOBAs and RPGs, just know that everything I'm about to say applies to this game from both perspectives. Dead Island Epidemic was dead on arrival from day one. The game had a very weird cartoony appearance that just didn't mend well with the subject matter and felt super effortless on the developer's part. What little story we got was wholly insignificant and was surrounded by obnoxious, repetitive gameplay that was nowhere near well conceived enough to face off with other big titles at that time, like League of Nations or Doge. Most importantly, perhaps, was that it was a Dead Island game. After two consecutive titles bombing with players everywhere, another game in the same name was surely doomed to fail the same way the others did. Furthermore, the shift in tonality from Dead Island and Dead Island Riptide to Dead Island Epidemic and then again to Escape Dead Island proves more than anything else that Deep Silver has no clue what the fuck this property was supposed to be. And yes, I'm aware that is a lot of names, I am also shocked that Deep Silver has not gone under by this point. In May of 2014, Epidemic was released to players on Steam through the Early Access program as an open beta, and before we could even begin to imagine what it would look like when it was finished, it was cancelled in 2015. The problem for me with this cancellation was that, since it was a MOBA, the servers for it are gone and there is no way to produce any new gameplay footage for it anymore. It just goes to show, though, that you can't mess with the flow, yo. What the fuck did I just say? It just goes to show that the most important part of a project from day one is the knowledge of where it should lead. In that respect, something like Victor Vran was a colossal success. An epidemic fell flat onto its face, rolled down a flight of concrete stairs, and flipped dick first into a paper shirt. Originality is important, but only where it really counts. When it comes to said originality, one game- Really? Really future me here to edit around that segue I was in the middle of? Uh, yeah, go, go fuck yourself. You know, this is exactly what my mother warned me about. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> anyway, Tom Fulp. Tom Fulp invented a website called Newgrounds. If you haven't heard of it, close the bedroom door and go a little exploring cause fuck me, it's crazy as shit. It was on that site that a man named Edward McMillan would release a Flash game called Meat Boy. Meat Boy would later become the inspiration for his game Super Meat Boy, which was a critical and financial success despite the questionable subject matter therein. Edward would later team up with a man named Florian Himsel to work on a project during a week-long game jam in 2011. The project of that game jam? The Binding of Isaac. Now Isaac, as I'll be calling him for the rest of this video, is more of a roguelike dungeon crawler with a top down perspective than an isometric RPG, at least in the way the mechanics function. The story and the characters of an RPG are there though, so I'm counting it, and you can suck a tarantula cock if you disagree with me, nerd. The Binding of Isaac was inspired by the biblical story of the same name, and was utilized by Macmillan to lay down some commentary on the positive and negative aspects of religion that he grew up experiencing within his own home. There's a lot to unpack here, so I'm just gonna kinda ramble off some stuff about the game and get to the nitty gritty afterwards. As a dungeon crawler, combat and movement came first, and it shows. Isaac plays smooth than butter, even by today's standards, nine years later, and to this day I continue to find new and interesting items and encounters whenever I play it. The levels in the game are all procedurally generated, so every experience is different from the moment you hit go, meaning that the game is basically endlessly replayable no matter what. You have the choice of 11 different characters, most if not all of them inspired by biblical icons. The art style is fucking phenomenal, serving every macabre purpose perfectly. Props to Macmillan for doing all that himself, by the way. The game's awesome. Whatever price it has next to it on Steam is totally worth it. Go out and buy it. If you don't already have it, you will not regret it. You won't regret it, and neither did anyone who bought it back in 2011. Reviews for Isaac were through the roof, with critics from all over praising it for its tight gameplay, unique and often abrasive story and visuals, and absolutely stellar soundtrack, created by a guy named Danny Baranowski, by the way. Note that comment I just made abrasive visuals. A good portion of what Isaac contains is meant to shock you and highlight various depravities and controversies that were present at the time of release. I'm talking about meat men, bloody ghost babies, the seven deadly sins, various demons, the kind of wacky shit you start to see if you pull an all-nighter to watch the Evil Dead films. Groovy. It's amazing. It's, it's just so good and you need to see it and you need to play it for yourself. So good. RPGs come in all shapes and sizes, as we've seen today, but one just hit the shelves that I think deserves some attention because it's way better than it has any right to be. Minecraft Dungeons is the literally brand new isometric ARPG created by Mojang, the developers of games like Minecraft, and 
in Minecraft. What's most fascinating about Minecraft Dungeons to me is that it's based around the existing lore of Minecraft and builds upon the features of that game to make something new. So here's the story. Bear with me. An Illager, the grey-skinned villagers of Minecraft, is banished from his village and sent out to wander because of his hideous Squidward nose. Tragic, I know. In his wandering, this Illager discovers the Orb of Dominance, an all-powerful artifact that allows him to form an empire of his own and make everybody call him daddy at the same time. You, as the hero, must fight your way through the Illager King's army of mobs and free the now-enslaved villagers from a horrible fate. It's super simple, accessible to basically anyone of all ages, and isn't ridiculously bogged down by dialogue or subtext like some other Minecraft properties while why would you do this to me, Patton Oswalt? The fact that the story isn't taking itself too seriously means that you're more focused on the gameplay, which is nice considering that you aren't stopping every so often to acquire a bunch of exposition or hunt down loose journals throughout each level like you would in a game like, say, Diablo. The focus on gameplay is perfect because it too is perfectly crafted. Combat is simple and done in the same style as Diablo, where you use the mouse to select a target and attack it, as well as move around each level. Your primary attack change is slightly based on what weapon you have equipped, whether it be an axe, a glaive, or some other variation of the crazy weapons that they've introduced for you to play with. Most of the weapons control similarly, as they're all melee weapons, but each weapon, even within the same subtype, can be uniquely enchanted to increase its power. This allows you to specify your playtime way more than other titles with a similar level of simplicity. Your second attack is a bow, and it will behave differently based on what type of bow you have equipped. Enchantments are also present here, as they are with armor that you can find by opening chests and killing enemies. In place of character abilities, Minecraft Dungeons instead gives you artifacts, which are reusable, persistent items that perform a wide variety of functions. My personal favorite is the Tasty Bone, actually, which gives you a wolf summon that is both adorable and makes for an awesome sacrificial lamb when you're playing on the higher difficulties. The game is divided into several different partially procedural levels, which means that the important parts of each mission, like objective zones, stay constant, while the areas around them are differently placed each time to spice up the adventure. There are also mini dungeons hidden in some of the levels that offer a slight reprieve from the linear story missions. By playing these smaller missions, you can unlock completely procedurally generated dungeon crawl levels that are absolutely fucking massive and allow for some awesome replayability. Personally, i found that the way that these levels are crafted has made this game super hard to put down. When I first started playing and experiencing the story, I booted the game up, had a blast with what I saw, and by the time I closed the game, three hours had passed, and it was nearly four in the fucking morning. <laughs> this game is awesome, and much like Minecraft, contains a super careful and precise polish that keeps it fun and entertaining. And I mean, look at this. It looks awesome, and it runs like a fucking dream. Even better, as I was writing this part of the script, they dropped the first DLC for the game, and it's been out for like a week. They seriously care about this project, which means you should too, or you'll miss it. Everybody should play this, I'm not even gonna lie. I don't care if you think the story is simple and boring, it's exactly what it needs to be, and it's told in the perfect way. The gameplay is some of the best I've seen in a new ARPG, and it keeps getting better the more and more you play it. Buy it. Seriously. Just fucking buy it. But, Dwed, I- Fuck you, I said buy it. So that's that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Um, this was a big endeavor in scripting, editing, finding all the footage, researching all the information, so uh, it'd mean the fucking world to me, honestly, if you would hit the like button or show it to a friend or comment something in the space below, assuming you can find wherever the fuck they moved the comments this time. Seriously, YouTube, what the fuck is this about? As always, this is the current photo of my works in progress folder. If you see something you like, hit the sub button and keep an eye out for when it comes out. I work on all these things concurrently as always, so uh, one will be out eventually uh, following this one. Thank you guys all so much for watching. Have a dreadful day.